Hello, Earth speaking. Hello, Dad. Yes, Bethy. The phone call you're about to hear is Beth Stoffer, who was kidnapped with her mother, Mary, on June 15, 1980, at 10.14 a.m. The kidnapper allowed Beth to call her dad on Father's Day. The FBI recorded it. Are you okay? Yeah. Is mommy okay? Yes. That's good. Oh, I'm... Mommy, happy, yes. Happy Father's Day. Oh, thank you so much, sweetie. You're fine, Dad. Oh, I'm so glad. We can't talk anymore. Um, when can you come home? I don't know. Can I talk... Can you okay, Dad? Can I talk to him? No. Okay, you call again. Okay. Bye. Bye-bye, sweetie. Mary Stoffer, 36, Beth Stoffer, her eight-year-old daughter, kidnapped, chained, abused for 53 days, but they escaped and Ming Sing Chu was arrested the same day. During the trial, he attacked Mary, leaving a scar on her face. He even hired a hitman to kill her, but she survived and made sure Ming would never terrorize anyone ever again. He had 53 days of our lives. He doesn't get another day. In the small town of Roseville, Minnesota, Mary lives with her husband Irv and their two children, Steve and sweet little Beth. The house is packed because the family is moving to the Philippines. It's May 16, 1980. Mary takes Beth for one last errand before the big day. As the hours go by with no news from them, Mary's husband Irv and their six-year-old son Steve are getting more and more worried. Around town, police are searching for a child named Jason, who was kidnapped that same day but they have no idea Mary and Beth are missing. It's nighttime. Irv finally decides to call the police. That's when he learns about the missing boy abducted by a dark-haired man. Irv fears the worst for his wife and daughter. The search goes national, roadblocks, ground teams, air support. They find Mary's car left in a ditch with no trace of Mary or Beth. As you can imagine, Irv is frantic and as the days pass, his hopes of seeing his family alive are growing thin. It's June 15, 1980. It's Father's Day, and Irv is at home with his son Steve, and there is still no news about Mary or Beth. It's been 30 days since their abduction. That's when the phone rings. Hello, Irv speaking. Hello, Dad. Yes, Bethy. Are you okay? Yeah. Is mommy okay? Yes. That's good. Oh, I'm... Mommy, happy, yes. happy Father's Day. Oh, thank you so much, sweetie. You're fine, Dad. Oh, I'm so glad. We can't talk anymore. Um, when can you come home? I don't know. Can I talk... Can you okay, Dad? Can I talk to him? No. Okay, you call again. Okay. Bye. Bye-bye, sweetie. This cryptic phone call hides a much more sinister truth of what happened to his daughter and wife. The day of the abduction, Mary and Beth are leaving the beauty salon. The two are walking through the parking lot. We saw a man walking toward us. And I looked up. I thought perhaps he wanted to ask directions. And he had a gun. He pulled out the gun and put it at Beth's side and said, I need a ride. He forces them into their own car and sits beside them. His gun pointed at Beth. Mary does everything the man says and drives off. She doesn't recognize the man. She doesn't know that she's supposed to. They stop at a red light. Directly behind them is a police car. We came to an intersection and I remember him saying, if that police car turns the same way we turn, you're dead. But the police car doesn't turn. After an hour of driving, the man tells Mary to stop the car. He opened the trunk, and I realized he was going to put us in the trunk. That was very, very scary for me. I said, please don't put us in the trunk. We won't be able to breathe. We were lying face down, and then the trunk was closed. Gag, tied, trapped in the trunk of a moving car. The two of them try their best to untie each other, but the noise captures the attention of the cat. The trunk lid and saw that her ropes were untied. 
With the trunk wide open, two boys on bikes comes near the car. One stays at the front of the car, one walks to the back trunk where he has it open and he looks in and he sees this woman and child duct taped together and his alarm and says, whoa. All of a sudden, something was uh, placed up on my feet. And then I could hear whimpering and I thought, this is a child. Six-year-old Jason Wolkman was just being curious. He saw something he shouldn't have and for that he was taken away. And so I started to talk. I said, my name is Mary and I'm 36 years old. And our daughter Beth is here and she's eight years old. And we don't know who this man is. And we don't know what he wants. And we don't know what he's gonna do to us. I think he said, I'm supposed to visit my grandpa and grandma tomorrow. And we just talked about being scared. And then the car came to a stop. And the trunk lid was open. And Jason was removed from the trunk and then the trunk lid was closed. And then all was quiet. And I remember thinking, he's left us here to die a slow death in the trunk. But after what seems like an eternity, the man comes back. He takes them out of the car into a van, but there is no sign of Jason. Mary asked, what did he do with the boy? He said he left them somewhere he could be found. He lied. It would take the police months to find out Jason had been murdered. But Mary is not stupid. She knows not to trust anything the man says, and she's terrified of what he might do to her and her daughter. We didn't know from minute to minute whether we would be alive the next minute. Then Mary and Beth are led into a small house and forced into a teeny bedroom closet, a closet that's been converted into a prison. There was a light bulb with a pull chain there was a scatter rug on the floor and two small throw pillows. They took a screwdriver and removed the doorknob from the inside of the door and we were locked into that closet. Our hands were still tied. We could not reach up and turn on the light. And so the only thing we could do is lie down on that floor. We just had to try to get some rest because we didn't know what the next day would bring. She knows right away this was not a random occurrence, that, that this was planned. And their terror, of course, escalated at that point. In the first week of their capture, Mary is taken into the living room where the man ties her to her couch. He removes her blindfold. She sees that a camcord is set up and she's being filmed. Then she finally discovers what this is all about. He had actually been up in the woods behind our house, probably using binoculars. He knew that Beth had a little makeup Barbie that uh, was on the dresser top of her room. He knew our son, Steve. He knew that my parents had been to visit. He had followed me down the highway one time. In fact, he even knew where the spare key to our apartment was. The man was obsessed with Mary. He had been stalking her for 10 years. And since she was moving to the Philippines, he wanted to capture her before it was too late. Fifteen years earlier, Mary was a high school teacher. In her classroom, a boy named Ming Sing Chu becomes infatuated with Mary. Fifteen-year-old Ming is reportedly violent towards his younger brothers and sisters, and his mother is terrified of him. This can only mean bad news for the teacher he locked eyes on. At the end of the year, he gets upset over a grade he claims broke his perfect score. He said, do you remember what grade you gave me? And I said, well, no, I don't, but it must have been an F for you to do this to me. He warns them multiple times that if they tried anything, he would kill them. He hammered it into us. If I ran away, he'd kill her. If you did anything, he'd kill me. June 7th, Ming takes his fantasy of having a family life with Mary further and rents an RV for a road trip to Chicago. He leaves Beth inside the RV chained while Mary and him go out in public with his gun keeping her in check. During that trip, both Mary and Beth make attempts to get rescued. Mary uses her traveler's checks to pay, knowing it should alert the FBI of her transactions and whereabouts. The FBI never received that information. Beth, on the other hand, takes the risk of ripping the blinds off of a window and peers outside just as some teens are passing. For the first time, she's had the courage to act even though Ming has threatened to kill her mom if she tried anything. She yells out at the teen, saying she was abducted and asked for help, 
but the teens laugh at her and tell her to stop making stories, and they leave. July 4th, Ming takes them to see the fireworks. Before getting out of the van, he warns them that if they tried anything, he would kill them. At that moment, a police car drives by and stops at the red light. Mary doesn't dare do anything, but she memorizes the phone number written on the back of the police car. When they got home later that night, she makes Beth memorize it too. July 6th. As they sit around the table, Ming has them playing out another family fantasy. This one, family game night. That's when he announced the worst news Mary ever heard. He's taking them far away to another home. Mary can feel the excitement in Ming's voice, but she also feels with despair. There were times when I questioned my faith. Sometimes I'd be so discouraged day after day, no rescue, no nothing. But Beth was sensitive to that. One day she said, Mom, do you think that God is going to send his angel to open the door for us like he did for Peter and the other guy? And in my deep heart of hearts, I didn't think it was going to happen that way at all. But I don't want to destroy the faith of a child. And so I said, well, he certainly could do that, but he might choose a different way. Time is running out. Mary knows she has to risk it all. July 7th. While Ming is out, Mary and Beth are chained tightly to the door inside the closet. Mary staring at the door hinges, thinking, thinking. She knows Ming could be back any second. She has no tools, just her fingernails to remove the hinge pins. She knows it's unlikely the pins will come out easy, but she has to try. So I went over to the door, I held the door with one hand, and I pulled the hinge pin with the other. It came out just like it was greased. The door separated. It was clear that our cable was going to come through. Beth, she panicked right away. She started pulling on my clothes. She said, Mama, don't do it. Mama, you know what he said? If he finds us escaping, he's going to kill us. You know, I mean, she was really panicked. I slapped her cheek. I sat her down in the chair and I said, listen, Beth, if God has given us this way of escape, we have to take it. Sure, it's dangerous. If Ming comes home and finds us escaping, he's going to kill us. We know that. But if this is God's way, he's going to take care of us. But I can't fight against you. We have to work together in this. We're chained together and we have to work together. Beth understands and they make their way to the kitchen. Mary grabs a phone and dials the number she memorized from the back of the police car. A moment later, a dispatcher answers. The dispatcher gives Mary strict instructions to stay inside the house and away from the windows. Mary ends the call. Beth then tells her mother they should wait outside for the police, that they could hide behind the bushes. Mary listens to her daughter. Going against the dispatcher's instructions, they leave through the back door of the house while still chained together. They crouch behind a car out of sight, but they had no idea that at that moment police are already there securing the area, getting ready to move in on the house. Expecting to see the two of them inside, the officers break in. At that very moment, police notice a car parked outside. There's a chance Ming made it home before the police arrived. The officers move in on the car. They see a figure from underneath, crouching, hiding behind the car. Mary and Beth have been found. Approximately 3.30 this afternoon, our Ramsey County Sheriff's dispatcher received a phone call from a woman who identified herself as Mary Stauffer. She stated she had freed herself from a shackled position. The day we escaped, the air smelt sweet, like I remember the feeling of the sun. There's nothing like just feeling the freedom. When we were taken to the sheriff's office and I first saw my husband Irv and our son Steve, it was just so marvelous to hug each other. The police arrest Ming the very same day, but the relief is met with tragic news. When the officers escort Mary and her daughter to the station, they ask that the boy Jason is still inside the house. This confirmed how Mary felt all along. Jason was dead and they still have not found his body. Before long, Mary and Beth are called to testify against Ming in court. He said, even if I get put in prison for a very long time, when I get out, I'll go after you, and if you're dead, I'll go after your kids. While in prison, Ming hires one of the inmates and promises 50K if he kills Mary and Beth before the trial. 
but the inmate goes directly to the FBI and tells them everything. Ming is furious, but he knows he'll see Mary one more time during the trial. In 1980 and 1981, there were two trials. One was for the kidnapping of Beth and me, and the other was for the murder of Jason Wolfman. Our abductor jumped up from his place at the defense table. He grabbed me by the neck and held a knife in front of me and said, get back or I'll kill her. I was cut on my face. He made a choice. He had 53 days of our lives. He doesn't get another day. Ming was sentenced to 30 years to life for the kidnapping of Mary Stauffer and her then eight-year-old daughter, Beth, as well as 40 years for the murder of Jason Wilkman.